yang Diego. Oke. Okay. Ya. Yeah. So uh, JB man, good evening everyone. Uh, Ambedkar Reading Circle invites you all for this online talk by Professor Yashpal. So a bit about Ambedkar Reading Circle. Ambedkar Reading Circle has been started uh, on last April. We used to conduct events and uh, reading sessions around the dispose of anti caste every, every month. So every month we used to have an event on Carbon Reads Ambedkar. And then apart from it, another event, it will be either a talk or workshops around the discourse of anti-caste. So on this evening, we would like to invite you all for the talk by Professor on caste and psychology, bridging the gap. A short note about our Professor Dr. Eshpal. He is an associate professor of psychology in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and a faculty advisor for Initiative for Caste Equity, Office of Diversity and Inclusion at IIT Delhi. His primary research interests include group processes and intergroup relations, particularly intergroup humiliation, prejudice leadership, political rhetoric, and collective mobilization, social psychology of caste, stigma, and well being among marginalized groups. Yeah. So, uh, well, good evening, Professor. We are happy to have you here for this talk. And about the lecture, I will explain a bit. Psychology is conscious conspicuously absent from the anti-caste discourse, according to the professor. So in his talk, he'll discuss the ways in which psychology is implicated in the caste oppression. He argues that the psychology constitutes a power relation that anti-caste scholarship and activism must confront. The caste oppressed people are at the mercy of a regressive and damaging psychological theory and practice. So there is an urgent need to explore the emancipatory potential of psychology. We no longer afford to postpone or ignore the project of developing a critical and ambedkarite social psychology that contribute to annihilation of caste. As a small step in this direction, he, he shares his experience of putting together forthcoming J's caste special issue on caste and psychology to highlight the gaps that exist and direction that needs to be forged. So after the talk of the professor, we'll have a discussion. Until that, if you have any doubts or queries regarding the talk, please keep it up with you. Hold for a while. We'll open up for discussion after the talks. I'll hand over the uh, talk uh, to the professor. Yes. Uh, thank you, Vignesh, for your kind introduction. Uh, yeah. And I'm uh, very grateful to Ambedkar Reading Circle. First of all, showing interest in the issues of psychology and uh, inviting me uh, to address uh, the gathering here. So uh, this is certainly uh, a very important uh, occasion because I don't remember when I was a student, something of this sort was possible. And I always wanted somebody. I somehow got into psychology uh, uh, and certainly sat and, and uh, wanted to ask certain questions that were part of my own lived experience and of the people uh, that I belong to. And so these, I always long for these sort of occasions where these questions uh, could be asked and these uh, issues could be talked about. So I'm very happy to see that uh, uh, there is now a platform where uh, we can raise new issues and discuss about future directions. So I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity and your kind invitation. Uh, I must admit before we go further that I have, uh, uh, I think, uh, feeling a little bit feverish. So I'll try to uh, do uh, the best that is possible in this condition. But uh, please bear with me uh, if I struggle a little bit. Uh, but I think uh, 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 I can manage. OK, uh, I, of course, I, I didn't want to miss this opportunity. Uh, so uh, let's let's start <clears throat> by, you know, in a sense, contextualizing what we are talking about here. Because what I wanted to emphasize uh, in the note uh, for this talk was that see, psychology has not been part of the anti-caste conversations that uh, we have uh, very prominent contributions from sociology, anthropology, economics, uh, of course, history. Uh, but uh, when it comes to 
psychology, we really don't have much to rely on. So uh, that is why it's very important, first of all, to, to explore what exactly psychology can offer to caste related issues and what caste related issues can in, in return uh, offer to psychology. And I think uh, that is why this, this question of bridging the gap, uh, creating a meeting, creating an interaction between a discipline that is now uh, more than 100 years old, a discipline that has been very influential and very prominent and certainly shapes so many things that we deal with consciously and consciously and caste uh, uh, research on scientific research on caste is at least few hundred years old and we had to wait this much time to to actually start talking about bridging the gap between caste and psychology that itself shows that uh, this has been uh, uh, an important area that uh, we needed to address uh, but we haven't done it so far so with this brief uh, uh background i would like to highlight these are some of the points that i'll try to cover at least touch them uh in our conversation so first i would like to begin with highlighting some achievements and failures uh of psychology as a discipline then i'll i'll, I'll also highlight what has been the trajectory of psychology in india the psychology definitely is was a colonial import in the Indian context of how it has flourished, developed in India, and even psychology in India now is more than 100 years old. Then I would emphasize, this is the central point that I want to make, that there has been an epistemic exclusion of caste in psychology. And in the way psychologists have dealt with issues of caste, I see that there has been a damage to identity and agency of the oppressed people. That's why there is an urgent need to address this issue. And then certainly we need a, a new psychology. We can discuss what may be the parameters and directions of this new psychology, what would be the foundation and what would be the aim, objective of this new psychology. But uh, I would simply like to highlight the need for it and the foundation that already exists, which we have not explored adequately. And finally, as a step in this direction, I would I'd like to highlight the forthcoming special issue uh, of uh, JCAS, that is CAST, uh, Global Journal of Social Exclusion, published by Brandeis University US, uh, edited by uh, Professor Larry Simon and Professor Sukhdev Thora. So just like to highlight some of the issues and some of the experiences I had while putting this issue together. So let me start with a positive note, what psychology has exactly achieved. One thing is very clear when we read history of psychology, psychology, and it's often said uh, that psychology has a long past but short history. Why is that? Because psychological ideas have already, always been discussed. We were always talking about various ideas that refer to mind in some manner or form, but we didn't develop psychology as a discipline. Earlier it was addressed as part of philosophy, many philosophers. That's why when you look at the early uh, years or early decades of psychology, development of psychology, you will find that many philosophers have actually been engaging with psychology. So that psychology emerged from philosophy uh, as a separate discipline with a specific focus on what sort of methods that could be used and especially emphasis on empiricism that we need to test, we need to validate to understand uh, uh the reality and definitely with the new conception of reality uh that was needed at that time uh in uh, 18th and 19th century psychology emerged as a discipline and played a key role of course psychology is being very much developed in the west especially in the north america and europe uh first psychological laboratory was set up in germany university of Leipzig by william wundt i think it was uh 1879 something first textbook of psychology was written in 1890 william james principles of psychology and then on of course one of the aspect one of the issues that psychology dealt uh, being situated in the west was the issue of race 
And when we see the track record of psychology with regard to this, uh, we have so many things to learn, both positive and negative. But let me highlight some of the positive achievements. One of the important achievements of psychology has been through the contributions of black psychologists, especially psychologists and civil rights activists such as Mamie and Kenneth Clark. Uh, Kenneth Clark wrote a book in, in, I think, early decades of the 20th century called as Dark Ghetto, which, which told people about what exactly is, this, is the reality from a psychological perspective, what exactly is the reality of living in, in ghettos, in black ghettos, living in a place like Har Harlem in New York. So he was the first who, who engaged, who developed a basis for psychology to, to emerge uh, from the black activism. Uh, and uh, his, he, along with his partner, he conducted what came to be known as black doll studies. And those studies played a key role in changing uh, society in the US, especially addressing the issue of racial segregation. So what is very clear when we read that history is that psychology has facilitated social change in European and North American contexts. Two, and uh, along with race, another, another uh, example that I would like to quote here is the way psychologists have addressed what really happened in the Holocaust. Especially uh, the, the discipline that I come from, social psychology has been very seriously engaged with understanding the psychology of evil, psychology of tyranny that was part of uh, Holocaust. How, how come people, six million people and even more were killed simply because they belong to the, the other social group? How is that possible? What sort of a psychology makes that sort of a extermination, violence, evil possible? And many social psychology try to address and many of the theories and concepts that we have at our disposal actually come from that enterprise. So in that sense, psychology has done a remarkable job in addressing the condition of oppression, uh, violence experienced by oppressed people and facilitating the overall social change. Uh, the various sorts of concepts uh, uh, have been developed such as uh, prejudice, stereotypes, stigma, other, all other, I, 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 all these concepts, these are not simply words that we use. These are scientific concepts with proper theory and, and ability to predict human thinking and behavior. That is their strength. And psychologists have spent decades of research uh, and practice to develop these, these tools. These are almost very important tools now that could be used to address situation in many secret societies across the world. Most importantly, psychological impact of social inequality and oppression in the context of racism and colonialism has also been very well addressed, especially uh, uh, inspired by scholars like Franz Fanon. Psychologists have addressed the uh, issue of how colonial oppression can lead to uh, internalization of inferiority, can lead to uh, damage to the self. And one very important organized attempt that uh, we must note in this social change, especially in the, in the United States, is the foundation of SPSSI, uh, called as Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. It was founded in 1936 and it played a key role in civil rights movement. There is a speech that I would like you to explore, uh, given by Martin Luther King Jr. to SPSSI. And it's, a, it's a very powerful speech and you can see someone like Martin Luther King, civil rights activists, engaging with psychologists, talking to them about the social change that we want in a society, itself shows the kind of work that, that, uh, that was happening uh, in the psychology. So this is the positive, and there are many other positive aspects definitely we can mention uh, and we can point out, but what is really concerning and what is really serious is also to look at psychology's failures. And it's a sad and somewhat shameful fact for, for many psychologists that psychologists have now and then taken racist positions. American Psychological Association is one of the leading psychology organizations in the world. 
if many of you are uh, uh, writing research papers, you may have come across APA writing style, citation style. So APA, that is American Psychological Association, is a very influential uh, organization in psychology. And in the early decades of 20th century, APA, APA presidents have been proponents of eugenic movement, which is again a racist movement and have taken racist position in many of the debates. So, and otherwise as well, apart from taking racist position, otherwise as well, we will also, we have many instances where, I, especially through the way theory and research is developed in psychology, that there is this, this emphasis on adjustment that people need to adjust well to their reality. Now, when psychologists emphasize on adjustment, good adjustment, good behavior, good thinking, then it really justify it. What it does is that it ends up justifying the status quo and leaves little room for the kind of anger, kind of resentment, kind of kind of urge that is needed to change the society. So one of the criticisms against psychology is that yes at least in part psychology supported status quo and all this has led to and very recently just on october 29 2021 when we were in the pandemic very recently uh american psychological association has apologized has apologized uh, to people of color for apa's role in promoting perpetuating and failing to challenge racism, racial discrimination, and human hierarchy in US. This showed why would an agency like APA apologize? This shows the failure. This shows that, that, the, that psychology has been a sort of white-centric discipline. The way it, 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 it developed in US, the way it is now operating in US, and that, that psychology of uh, that aspect of white supremacy is still very, very concerning and is still very dominant. So this apology in itself provides us an instance where we can see the, the, the way psychological ideas are not neutral. Psychological ideas can end up supporting an unjust social system, supporting racism, supporting sexism. But this is about waste. Some of you may say that this is about waste. What about India? What has been the trajectory of psychology in India? Let us let us let us then look at what is what was really happening at our home. Again, as the first point that I would like to emphasize to you all uh, in with regard to psychology in India is that it is old. First. It, is, it has more than 100 years of history. So it's not something that is that we have just started noticing, just started doing. And that is why it is very legitimate question to ask to what extent psychologists have really engaged with issues of caste. It's not an illegitimate question to ask. It's a, it's, I think, is a legitimate question to ask, given the history and given the background. And it's not the case that we always were impoverished, intellectually impoverished, in terms of not having good psychologists uh, in India who had the ability uh, to address complications uh, uh, or, or complex issues such as caste. But uh, what we see is that psychologists in India had links with all over the world, especially Giridra Shekhar Bose, and this is the often quoted example that uh, he was a chairman of the Calcutta University Department of Psychology in 1920s. He had a very close links with Sigmund Freud. And those who are from cultural studies, uh, maybe from philosophy, uh, sadly, psychologists do not engage that much with Sigmund Freud now. Uh, but in other disciplines, Freud is a, is a big name and is a big influence, and rightly so. Freud is also a, also a very important, remarkable psychological thinker. You can disagree with, with many things with Freud, but uh, reading Freud and, and appreciating his contribution is very important. But what is interesting to see is that many Indians 
still hold chairs in world class departments of psychology around the world and i have quoted some names and these people have contributed well to the psychology they have been internationally recognized but when we see to what extent then these psychologists have addressed the issues of caste or the experience and feelings of oppressed people uh, in indian society we 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 are we feel disappointed there is not much to go back there is no continuity there is no sustained interest there is no commitment to 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 understand these issues there is no focus on social justice let me highlight some of the key moments so that we understand the historical historical trajectory of psychology in india some of the key moments uh, that are important first is the the large scale violence that uh, we witnessed during the partition uh, led to formation of what is called as the tensions project the, this was a project that uh, uh, nehruvian government uh, and unesco uh, developed together they invited a leading uh, american psychologist at that time a social psychologist at that time gardner murphy and he set up small teams of various scholars across india and they they kind of they attempted to map out uh, the the various tensions conflict between communities various issues that exist in the communities and of course their main focus uh, remained on hindu muslim relations hindu muslim violence conflict riots still caste was part of the conversation caste received some attention in this so but overall this the and this all this research is very well summarized so i think the book is available online if you uh, search google you may become you may be able to find the uh, the copy of a uh, pdf copy of this book in the minds of may published in 1953 so there was recognition that caste is certainly a very important issue along with religion in india but then in 1950s from between 1950s and 70s in these two decades there was some some attention to caste related issues so if you search various uh, databases if you search google scholar you will come across some of the research uh, published in these these two decades uh, uh, try talking about caste based stereotypes prejudices and so on so forth however you would be surprised that there would be a complete silence after 1980s there would not be you will not be able to find much research not the kind of research that that existed in the earlier two decades you will see that there is the silence is deepening as the decades go by and what we hear about is emergence of what is called as indian psychology you know what is indian psychology this indian psychology is a psychology of the past of the hindu sacred text which focuses on trying to develop first of all a comparison between uh, western frameworks western psychological frameworks uh, and their indian counterparts that are found in various religious sacred texts so a typical research in this area would be looking at how bhagavad gita develops a theory of personality comparing it with theories of personality by say freud by other uh, people so but this is an enterprise that is so backward looking it's not really engaging with the reality that people are facing especially the reality of caste and we certainly to what extent that this indian psychology is indian enough is another question is too much uh, focus on the traditions hindu traditions at, uh, at the cost of excluding other sets of traditions because even philosophically religiously and in so many ways uh, we are a diverse nation so in in my estimation indian psychology is a regressive step it is not really addressing the realities on the ground but that's been that became one of the important trends uh, especially psych indian psychologists started talking about what they called as indigenization that is developing psychology from the 
from the cultural social roots that exist uh, in a particular setting and of course this was to do with uh, the, the the domination of the west in defining psychological theory and practices which in a sense given the colonial experience is justified is is i think to some extent it's right but while addressing colonialism uh, ignoring caste uh, is a different is, is a kind of a dubious strategy that was developed and what we find now if you explore is that there is sensitivity to the issues of decolonization this is a you'll find that the leading journals of psychology in india psychology of psychology and developing societies psychological studies talking about these issues of decolonization culture culture is a big, big concern uh, but there is lack of commitment to study marginalization inequality sexism and caste is almost excluded almost excluded even from the imagination and even when caste comes it doesn't come as a system that oppresses exploits and damages people it comes as some sort of an innocuous social arrangement that we all are part of and then there are other sorts of things that have emerged such as cognitive science which in a sense again tries to develop more universal kind of psychology but again at the exclusion of the social context that influences our thinking and behavior so what we find is the condition where psychology systematically exclude discussions on caste i could also give you another trajectory where all the social science discussions uh, do not adequately address psychology of caste but i think that is that would be an unjustified critique because because who should do the develop uh, who should undertake the responsibility of developing the psychological analysis of caste issues i think psychology should bear the first responsibility and then followed by other social scientists so other social scientists cannot be uh, blamed for lack of developing psychological uh, understanding but certainly it is the discussion is needed and what we need to now understand is the, that we find ourselves in a situation where there is epistemic exclusion of caste which leaves so many questions unanswered in terms of the think thoughts feelings behaviors shaped by caste relations in our everyday life which leaves so many questions unanswered and even when you read a book on caste say for example i would suggest you to pick say uh the surinder surinder jotka's book on caste uh, published i think a few years back uh the I mean, it's, a, it's a book by a prominent sociologist but you will see that the way it intellectually develops its trajectory it comes to the issues of caste based prejudice and stereotypes and stops you read various sorts of analysis on various sorts of reviews everybody kind of charts a territory and then comes to a point where there are psychological issues and stops so certainly psychologists have to come forward or other people need to undertake the responsibility of addressing psychological dimension to address the issues of caste so we are at a moment where we need to uh, forge a new path let me now highlight in the practice especially in the practice how especially because psychology one imagination of psychology is that it is related to clinic it is related to counseling and so let me highlight what is really happening in terms of clinic and counseling and what is really happening in terms of issues of caste there now what we see and there are some some uh, issues that i would highlight here the first is that majority of research that is dealing with these issues uh, uh, of clinic are deeply ingrained in uh, in caste biases the practice itself is deeply ingrained in caste bias uh, why it is because i think there are two sets of issues here 
first of all there is no systematic focus on the on the experience of caste based marginalization and exclusion in these disciplines and that focus is not there because not many psychologists from various sorts of oppressed communities work and and find a path to address these issues so what we see in terms of psychology's practice and profession that there is a lack of diversity it's a very homogeneous field dominated by people from only certain sections people from dominant sections of the society obviously they are not going to examine their own privilege in sustaining operation may not even when they do that they will create lot of moral contradictions so a diversity is needed in terms of having professions and practitioners uh, from different communities and castes addressing their experiences through this this uh, venture but that has not happened so what we find is that there is ignore uh, there, there is neglect of experience of some suffering among marginalized and there is no development of a culturally especially uh, one specific psychologists that we must note who has contributed immensely in our understand shaping our understanding of clinic and caste is professor shushru jadhav uh, and if you explore professor jadhav's work you would see that 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 the complications that exist for psychiatry and clinical psychology to center the lived experience of the marginalized people so many of the framework that are invoked would in a sense pathologize would again ask the the caste oppressed victim to adjust to the reality you know what does it mean to adjust to the reality how can you ad supposed to adjust to an oppressive reality that in it itself is sustaining oppression so the focus and there is a very shrewd politics that is played in these disciplines that social is disengaged from the individual there is so much focus on individual at the cost of exclusion of social but how can an individual exist without the social an individual is always embedded in certain social context psychological processes whatever you are talking about they do not really exist in any vacuum they exist in a social context and that social context the basic thing that can be said about that social context is that it is unequal and it is oppressive so it is important to take a critical lens to take, to ask the hard questions to 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 look at the politics of ideas and politics of practice that is being done here one can't be innocent to these these suggestions to adjust one goes to a counselor and what is the experience that you adjust to the negative thoughts you have to the anger that you have but how do you engage with that anger where is that anger coming from it's not coming from that individual's own personal issues it is coming from the social experience that an individual is having because of the oppressive structure of the caste so what should psychology do to address that oppressive structure is the key question that needs to be asked but what we find is that the way all these all these avenues are structured they are they are structured in the way that they would feed into status quo again going back to the apology issued by apa the very structure is the the very structure of psychology if it is geared towards sustaining an oppressive status quo we definitely need to think uh, on a new foundation so what we find is that among mental health professionals in the context of indian culture they, first of all there is exclusion of dalits and lower caste professionals marginalization that they experience which is, uh, at, at the same time there is this this and especially this is also part of the supervisory uh, the, the the phd supervision sort of uh, pro, uh, uh, engagement that exists in psychology that it's it's very hard to find uh, that that space where one can engage and ask these sort of questions so this guru shishya master disciple relationship is you know very limited uh, to development of new professionals new uh, practitioners uh, in psychology and psychiatry
And another thing that is also highlighted by Professor Jadav is that the existing diagnostic assessment criteria are inadequate in the sense that all the, the way counselors and psych, uh, clinical psychologists think about various mental uh, experiences and predicaments in itself is inadequate. How can they judge what exactly is a pathology from a, 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 a condition that is going to give birth to a new energy? That, so how do, how, how do you understand the experience of distress? Distress could be too positive. Even when psychologists talk about stress, stress is not always a negative element. In fact, we need certain sense of stress to be functional. So what is really important to ask the questions about the social structure, how it disciplines, how it governs people, but somehow that is excluded from all these uh, uh, discussions. And if we go further, especially if we go further into counseling practices, we find that the, the, the relationship, which is the counseling, what is counseling? Counseling is not a magic bullet to address any form of distress. Counseling is merely a, a, a meaningful relationship, a therapeutic relationship that helps you uncover the issues that you are experiencing and, be, and empower you to deal with them in a systematic way. So counseling is a relationship and how do you form this relationship that that effective relationship between counselor and client is is the foundation of the counseling practice which is not possible because of the boundaries of caste because of the lack of availability of counselors belonging to dalit bahujan adivasi and other uh, oppressed communities and there are many other issues that have been already noted in the literature, such as top-down approach to mental health services, that, that the, the local mental health concerns in rural India are not very well addressed because most of these engagements are very much inspired by the West. So many of the theories, practices are derived from what is really happening there and then kind of mimicking those practices. That creates issues uh, in terms of not having rooted uh, to the ground realities that exist. And what Professor Jadav says, we must attend to that point, is that clinics are not only exclusive and expensive, but also far more out of reach and culturally distant. So what can we really do to develop uh, uh, an access that is meaningful, that is helpful, and that is empowering to the individual and communities. Helping individual but damaging communities is a regressive strategy. Uh, any, any form of psychological help would be damaging if it only focuses on an individual, if it abstracts individual from the context in which they are embedded. So certainly we need to think more critically about various psychological ideas, various psychological practices, especially various settings developed by psychology as a discipline, such as the clinic. We certainly need to take a more critical approach towards that. And I hope I, I was able to convince you with this point. Moving on, and this is again, <laughs> adding to the failures that I was talking about. This is again adding to the, to the kind of shameful state of psychology uh, that we are talking about. Is the question that, how does psychology talk about oppressed people? And this is a, this is a very important question to be asked. Psychology is about people. Psychology is not talking about atoms, molecules, nucleons, electrons, and other particles. Psychology is talking about people. It is about people. It is for people. Now, how is, how, how is it developing an understanding of certain sections of people? What we find in psychological literature, my reading is that, Psychological literature portrays Dalits and other stigmatized people as voiceless victims of social order. While there is so much focus on 
how the social order shapes various psychological parameters of caste oppressed people there is almost nil research in exploring what is the agency of the oppressed people in india to challenge their oppression to challenge their disadvantage so there is very limited focus on the collective action the protest the efforts for social change among oppressed communities so we do not find many psychologists actually talking about leadership actually talking about social change social justice so and what we find uh, on the contrary is that many studies emphasize the psychological damage reflected and they compare various caste categories and they emphasize that that dalits and lower castes have deficient personality you can go and explore i have i'm citing these studies these are not my words i have put them in the quotations lower cognitive competence negative self perception what they called as affective syndrome crisis maji then goes 1989 so what this does is that create a very deficient picture of certain section of people that they are psychologically deficient now that creates a political that's a political intervention so psychology is not devoid of politics and this is done by excluding any systematic research into the experiences of dalits in the localities that they are forced to live uh, such as traditionally known as the nagar budwara ramai nagar phule nagar i i at least in my experience i have not come across many studies actually taking uh, a serious step in addressing the experience lived experience uh, in these uh, in these places and that is why they i would argue that psychologists know little about the resilience and resistance of caste oppressed people and there is a need to 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 engage with that that is why a political perspective is needed and that is why we must develop a new psychology that works towards caste annihilation that works towards the liberation that is that is the core and how do we do that how do we do that and when i'm proposing this idea for a new psychology i'm not saying that all that is done in the past is garbage and it's not going to be useful no i think we are we need to build on that foundation but we should not be uh, repeating the same mistake we need a new epistemic fo focus and we need a very clear value commitment because we are not talking about an innocuous phenomena we are talking about an oppressed phenomena so certainly our approach must be ethical our approach must be sensitive to the realities on the ground approach must be radical we cannot again develop uh, ideas and practices that feed into strengthening of oppressive social structures around the world and that is why there is need to discuss how do we develop a new psychology that contributes to the project of caste annihilation and we know very clearly and this is something that psychologists have ignored psychologists have not really taken baba saheb ambedkar seriously but when we one reads uh, baba saheb ambedkar's writing we'll see that baba saheb has been talking about psychological dimension quite seriously and quite able and this is a very famous quote in annihilation of caste where while emphasizing the ways to end caste with chatwat todak mandal baba saheb emphasizes that caste they must keep in mind that caste is a notion and it's a, it's an address it's it's a point that he is making to uh, all of us that caste is a notion it is a state of the mind the destruction of caste does not therefore mean the destruction of a physical barrier it means a notional change you may have read this quote many times but what does it exactly mean what the, what does it mean to say caste is a notion is it notion 
is it imaginary no it's not imaginary caste is rooted in a hard reality in an oppressive reality a material reality certainly caste is as material as it is notional but what baba sahib is emphasizing is that it is at the same time a state of mind it is something that is created in the interactions of between individual mind and the social structure social conditions so while we must do what we can to address socio political economic changes to the caste we must also pay attention to the various beliefs various sets of attitudes various sets of prejudices stereotypes and so on that are also part of the caste structure so as much as caste is outside the mind we must also understand that it is also inside the mind and so our approach should be two front in a sense it needs to also address the outer as well as the inner we have been addressing the outer we must now need to address the inner and that is why a new psychology is needed a key point we must note while thinking about uh, a new psychology which is anti caste in its commitment is that psychological ideas are not objective ways of understanding reality they also and i hope i have demonstrated with adequate evidence and of course i can i can share more work with you to help you understand and appreciate this point that psychology is a power relationship that it creates its power runs through the veins of psychology and we must take that power into account while thinking about psychological ideas they are not innocuous in nature they shape who we are what is our conception of the other how we relate with each other how we treat each other how we live together so from that point of view we definitely need to be more vigilant and the project of developing a critical that is what do i mean by critical i mean by critical being sensitive to the, to the power relations to the very least a critical stance would be sensitive to the power relations and an anti caste psychology and that can be developed on the foundations of the insights given by baba sahib and dr however psychologists have either ignored ambedkar psychological thinking see we had with self respect now let me give you one example we don't have much time uh, but uh, i think I, i have gone overboard and uh, may have bored you a little but uh, but just to give you one example of why ambedkar's uh, psychological thinking matter is matters is because see self respect is at its core and when we talk thought of self what can be more psychological than the concept of self if self respect is at the core of the movement of the caste of race people then that in itself encapsulates a psychological perspective so that is why then needed a systematic engagement a sincere reading of ambedkar which psychologists have failed to do they have whenever psychologists describe ambedkar they they relegate him to some non scientific sphere a political sphere a constitution maker etc but not really deal with him as a thinker as an influential powerful thinker so definitely we need to do more and we need to uh, engage with ambedkar as a scholar as a thinker we may disagree with some of his ideas some of his, some of the so for example a bit and, and this is something i can go on and on and on and i hope to write uh, more about this but but well he has read all the important text of the time he was a student of john dewey who is a very prominent psychologist uh and he must have read many critical and especially he quotes many psychological important psychological text so certainly there is more to go on but uh, we need a, an open approach and, and psychologists sadly uh it seems have been quite prejudiced in approaching ambedkar so moving on now let me talk about the what i have been doing for the past two years along with many other things 
this is something that is now coming together the special issue would be published uh, sometime next month hopefully uh, but all the contributions have come and this is a small step in the direction uh, of bridging the gap between caste and psychology and let me tell you one thing that about this this endeavor is that many of the contributors are young people like you now i'm not i am realizing that i'm not young too young anymore so i would count uh, myself among you uh, although in an academic uh, trajectory i am still young <laughs> but not age wise but uh, i would definitely uh, uh i'll see that many of students like you have come forward and and most of them have been writing their first papers we had a long kind of uh, engagements uh, 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 uh sort of uh, a mentoring process but now the special issue has come together and it is addressing various critical issues there are papers on caste based prejudice uh thinking about caste based prejudice showing it li links to expressions of casteism there there are papers on stereotyping the experience of stereotyping in uh, uh higher education institutions there is there is a clear very much focus a, a very clear focus on collective victimization in the context of memories how our memories are shaped by the caste structure uh there is a clear focus on various ways uh dalit are victimized and the ways they resist that victimization which is very important see operation caste focusing on caste based operation is one thing but it should not be at the cost of resistance because people do not engage with an operation reality post passively they do not remain passive they always try to find ways to address that operation and that is the focus on agency and resistance and that is needed so even in the studies on stigma there are papers addressing issues of stigma social exclusion you see that the, the the these contributions capture that spirit of protest resistance resilience and there are critical perspectives on theory and research practices of psychology not just psychology in india but psychology internationally and this critical perspective is at its core in the special issue and i hope uh, uh you will find it interesting and engaging and i hope you will think about uh, doing some work uh, in this direction uh, and engaging with psychology more so with this i would uh, uh like to conclude and there are two points that i would like to leave you with first a critical vigilance is necessary and this goes above and beyond uh, psychology whatever you are doing ideas are never neutral you definitely need to develop that critical vigilance you need to see what exactly it is leading to what does it mean you need to ask more questions and should never feel ashamed or should never feel burdened and should not go by anybody's authority or or any texts authority to uh, to feel discouraged to ask questions so that is something that is at the core a critical vigilance especially about psychological frameworks that can pathologize the victims of social order and maintain the status quo in society and this is something that we must confront and we must talk and we must emphasize and i leave you with this in point that the question therefore is not limited to just the bridging the gap not bridging the gap with any kind of psychology and caste bridging the gap with right kind of psychology and caste use of psychology in efforts to understand and annihilate caste is not the just the question the question is what sort of psychology can help or hinder those efforts and we need the right kind of psychology and perhaps we need and that is what i'm trying to hint at that we need a new psychology to perhaps develop a new foundation for annihilation of caste with this i'll 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 stop here and i look forward to your questions comment thank you thank you very much thank you professor it was such an engaging talk like yeah starting from this and also the new psychology with the existing foundation how it can be perceived thank you professor it was really an engaging talk so not taking much time i would like to open the floor for discussions just general instructions 
uh, if anyone has any queries or doubts, they can open, uh, they can raise their hands, and then we'll call the name. Then they can unmute themselves and speak. If they, are, if they are not able to speak here, if the audio has any issues, they can put their questions in the text. Yeah. Uh, so I see. We have hands here. Pranesh, can you unmute yourself? And I think uh, Abigail can go first. Yeah, Abigail, yeah. Your hands are raised for a long period of time. Sorry, Abigail, are you there? If it is. Uh, meanwhile, I can address a question in the in the text in the chat. Uh, Anuradha, yeah, yeah, Anuradha sure. single. Where can we access the journal? Which journal are we talking about? Jcas. If you are asking about Jcas, it's it's uh, online. It's uh, open access. So just Google Jcas and it will come. Okay, we can. Uh, Hari, you can. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for that great talk, Dr. Eshpal. Uh, so, uh, I I am working in similar uh, area. I am a clinical psychology trainee from uh, Nimhans, Bangalore. Uh, and my area, I was also trying to understand the whole aspect of culture and intersectionalities. And a lot of my participants also have spoken quite a lot uh, about the caste aspect of it and how mm -hmm. the whole psychology has been quite ignorant. And you have rightly pointed out, I, I think uh, I, I should also thank you for helping me with my review of literature. I can take a lot home. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, I would love thank to you, thank you, thank you, Ari. Uh, also request you if you can share some references for readings, uh, that would be really grateful. Yeah. Uh, not so uh, questions as such, but I would also love to uh, like, you know, take the references and maybe in some time future work with you on some or other paper. Great, great, great. No, certainly I'll, I'll, I'll share all the material uh, that I can. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think we need more uh, a systematic attempt to engage with this literature, to to ask more questions about it, what it what it means, what what it did, and what it can. Uh, how how do we address its limitations? So certainly, it's more. But I must also mention, too, while I was being very critical, uh, and sometimes critic. Uh, can be disempowering, but I also want to highlight the contributions of many people who are coming forward and addressing psychology, uh, psychological dimension of caste. I have not mentioned them uh, because the attempts are quite sporad sporadic. Apart from this uh, JCAS, I don't see uh, any systematic attempt, and that too uh, is the benefit of, uh, I think, inside that Professor Thorat had. Uh, that we need psychology, and that's how he invited me. Uh, but uh, there are many people who are also addressing caste, and I would love to share their work as well. Uh, I have learned from them as well, uh, and certainly there are many, many ways uh, we can go forward. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. I would love to read those material on differences that you share. So, Poliket, we saw your hand raised. You can go and then then we're next. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, good evening, Professor. Firstly, thank you so much for this insightful discussion. I think this was very needed for us as a, as a trainee clinical psychologist to really be more inclusive. And this is something that I've also noticed uh, in my training uh, that how mental health also collides with the social identity of the patient. And uh, when I was noticing it, I realized that in, including myself, all of my trainees and supervisors and even psychiatrists, they come from upper caste Hindu background. And somehow when we are in the clinic, we do not really 
understand the patient's experience, especially the identity and how it could have contributed to the development of a pathology. I really do not have any answer to the question that I'm asking, but this is something that I really want to understand. So how should I be more inclusive, caste inclusive, as an upper caste Vini myself? Yeah. So, uh, Pulkit, I think very, very, very important question. Very important question. Certainly very important question. And it relates to this core of social identity that we all have which we derive from various sorts of group we belong to. And certainly it's not easy if one is engaged, one is from a community that is in a sense implicated in, in operation. So that in itself creates a moral burden on, on individuals. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not easy to, to, to question the kind of assumptions, kind of perspectives that uh, that are part of the the experience uh, and engagement uh, but let me also add that even for somebody having lived experience of caste it is not easy to see the way they have internalized uh, certain uh, societal assumptions so it's a struggle on both sides it's a struggle on both sides and especially when it comes to the clinical practice the, 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 the problem is that there is not adequate understanding of taking social identities into account while forming various sets of relationships. So on, I think the question is on what foundation we form that relationship. Is it a foundation that is, that is morally good, that is geared towards liberation, that is geared towards certain ideals i think what is important and especially for the situation you are describing is a commitment to the values of democracy so the key question that i would ask if i was in your position is to what extent my thinking my practice my engagement follows the values that have been enshrined in our constitution that is the starting point and we'll definitely need to chart a path and we'll need to come to an understanding where we use our own experience of privilege or operation to, to understand and empathize with others. Because even among the oppressed, only one set of operation we are talking about caste. But what about gender? What about sexuality? What about other sets of operation? So certainly that in what is what is called as intersectional consciousness we all need to develop it's not the case that you are a victim of a social order you get an insight into that social order you just get a better epistemological perspective because you are standing below standing in on the ground you have a, a, a vantage point of looking at the whole structure other people find themselves on various floors of that structure so may miss out how does it look overall but for somebody who is oppressed just has a better epistemological vantage point but it doesn't mean they have an insight or they can automatically develop a commitment so what is important is a commitment to a value system that you follow that is democratic in its essence and you make you learn as we go as, as you go forward through your experiences and uh, uh, being open and, and questioning uh, various sets of biases that exist in, in ourselves and also uh, uh, in other people's minds i hope uh, uh, i can, <laughs> i had a better answer for you but uh, i think i think uh, i'll leave you with this thank you sir i'll Rather sit with it and think about it and then reflect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hari. So, can we take one question from the chat box and then we'll go to Tanvi? So, one question okay. is asked by Akshata. So one question I really liked what this was by Akshata Jonkar. What are your thoughts on participatory action research that centers the agency of the oppressed? And I think that is really, really a key question. And with the help of this question, I would like to highlight the importance of methods. Psychology or overall psychological sciences, there is a great deal of diversity in psychology, is an empirical science. 
it believes in testing things, in examining things, and then aggregate it. So methods are part of the practice. Methods are part of the thinking. Methods decide everything. And it is very important that our methods should not be narrow because there is a, a tendency that is quite dominant that uh, only experiments are valid. All other sorts of research is not valid, especially qualitative research is not taken seriously. In more, some leading journals won't even entertain a qualitative submission. That is the current status that I'm talking about. So in that context, participatory action research is very, very valuable. And it is an approach to address the issues of the community to empower the community. And that is that and by setting up certain ground rules for the researchers and uh, the participant to engage with. Otherwise, research ends up being an exploitative practice. And that this is an exploitation we must be aware of and participatory action research is, is a response to that ex research exploitation of the people. And that is why this, this is certainly a way forward. But there are also important limitations in participatory action research. First of all, it is expensive. It is time consuming, labor intensive. And what I would suggest is that we also need a diversity of methods. So participatory action research in and it's, uh, itself is great. But it may not be adequate to address all sorts of questions. I think our research question must guide choice of method rather than we making a commitment to one set of methods and then following that trajectory. That, in my view, is complicated because I would like to have freedom to maybe use an experiment to demonstrate an argument that I want to make rather than making a commitment beforehand that I can only do qualitative research, I can do only do participative research and lose out that argumentative capacity. So uh, my what is my commitment to? Is my commitment to a particular theory or a particular set of method or a particular form of a scholarship that is committed to certain set of values? I think that we must decide about ourselves. And just to uh, add, uh, a note because I am currently doing a participatory action research. It's a, it's a photo wise study looking at experiences and aspirations of Dalit Buddhist community. Uh, and we have done most work. We are going to have an exhibition, uh, hopefully this week itself in IIT Delhi. Uh, at, but, uh, but certainly I would, I would, I would love to see if you can do something with participatory action research and, uh, uh share uh, some experiences. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Tanveen, can you unmute yourself and go for the next question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that very insightful talk. I was wondering how, um, you know, uh, say, even in the case of Holocaust, um, how were the Nazis, you know, being talked about? Like, how much, I mean, there's a lot of uh, focus on <coughs> apologizing the victim like they have say uh, some anxiety disorder or they have some depressive disorder and all those yeah. things all but the, how much of the pathologizing yeah. how much of the pathologization is actually assigned to the oppressor because uh, i mean a lot of the actions that they might be taking you know could easily be uh, you know uh, uh, what do you say, categorized as bullying or emotional abuse and yeah, all yeah, those sort of yeah, things. Yeah. But how much of that actually, you know, how much of psychology is actually focusing on actions that actually lead to people living with these uh, anxiety disorders or uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there's so much of, I, I mean, I, I hope you got my uh, question. Yes, yes, yes. That means very very good question very good question uh, and it helps me address one of the key key aspects uh, yes pathologization is an important part of the way we understand evil so the, the issue goes back to how do we understand psychology of evil how do we understand the mindset that leads to violence, extermination of others. 
and what sort of a mind can really be comfortable uh, by killing of innocent people by systematic destruction the destruction sorry of uh, innocent people simply because they happen to be part of an outgroup as we call it social psychology so that definitely raises this question of what exactly is their mindset uh, is it the right mindset is it a healthy mindset or is it unhealthy mindset so pathological personality but pathological mindsets are part of the explanations that have been given after the holocaust uh, to give you an example i don't know and tell now this is this is the more nuanced attempt but just to give you uh, uh, an example uh, Ad adorno theodore adorno and colleagues focused on what they called as authoritarian personality and authoritarian personality was used to explain the kind of prejudice that was expressed against the the jewish victims in holocaust and also there were other sets of explanations floating around at that time explaining both the experience of the oppressor and the oppressed and pathologizing was done for both the parties it is not the case that when adolf eichmann was put to trial in jerusalem he was also seen as a sort of a monster uh, uh, an architect of the final solution an architect who created a system of of exterminating people with you know such a cold blooded manner so so we would definitely question the pathology that exists in the mind but the problem if we say so first of all i would clarify that this pathologizing discourse about the victim blaming the victim narrative it's uh, or are emphasizing the victims who are deficient is politically mobilized it's wrong it's problematic morally problematic however when it comes to thinking about the mind of the oppressor calling the mind of the oppressor a pathological mind is again a different set of complication so what do we think do we think that the Go goebbels uh, eichmann uh, uh, and uh, hitler uh, were they mentally disturbed people i think that is an explanation that will lead us nowhere and the point that we must understand here is that is that that this genocide the engaging in genocide is not an act that is done in a feat of anger it's a systematic act it requires so if you read more into holocaust you will see that it was a bureaucratic enterprise it needed to function as a bureaucracy it needed much thought much processing much organization and in fact the kind of argument that alkman made Uh, in his defense in, in at the trials in jerusalem is that he said i am only a clog in the wheel i am only part of the big machine that operated and i was only following orders that was his defense you must read anna arendt's eichmann in jerusalem what she sees and she was hoping to see a monster what she see what she saw was just an ordinary bureaucrat just a kind of a clerk that we engage and interact on an everyday basis just a paid pusher and this person a flesh and bones has killed more than 6 million people hard to imagine and what she writes is that he was eichmann was terrifyingly normal these are her words terrifyingly normal and she developed this concept of what she called as banality of evil that evil is not a property of a pathological mind it's banal it's every day it's common you and i can turn violent under certain conditions we what we must understand is the conditions that lead people to various sets of corners and we must understand the values and beliefs that guide their behavior and so what she emphasized is that and is that 
it's not the case and because it, it is a very easy it's a very easy escape for an oppressor to say oh i was not feeling well i was mentally disturbed and that's why i killed somebody i harmed somebody i humiliated somebody it's a very easy escape it's just displacing mental blame on a psychological state which is not true because what is important is that they engaged in this act because they truly thought that that is the moral choice they must make that they truly thought that killing 6 million people was a morally good thing to do was a virtue what we must attack is their notion of virtue not their mindset that where did they derive that notion of virtue that it is okay to kill 6 million people what sort of an ideology what sort of a what sort of prejudice and stereotype actually lead you to see others in such a dehumanized way that is the right question to ask and that is why these these issues are very important to understand uh, in terms of pathologization but we must ask the right question we must ask the right question especially while dealing with the 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 oppressors i hope it it addresses your question yeah that was very helpful thank you thank you Thank you, Professor. So, uh, since we have very less time, uh, there are four more peer participants here and two more questions are there in the chat box. Professor, if you're okay, can we take two questions together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Aline and next Kesha can go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It was really insightful. Um, I just wanted to ask two questions, if that's okay. Uh, if it's not, I'll just focus on one of them. Uh, so the first one was uh, uh, like the concept of indigenous psychology like you talked about how it's mostly indian scholars who are from the upper caste backgrounds who are conceptualizing uh, that particular field but as someone like i come from a tribal community uh, and uh, the idea of indigenous psychology uh, feels uh, it's obviously very like uh, it's a very different idea for me when i'm trying to understand it so when we're developing it from the marginalized uh, uh, sides of it how do we move about because a lot of our ideas uh, stem uh, work on the line of oppression right how we are uh, uh, you know uh, just uh, yeah oppression right so but how do we move a, a bit beyond it where the ideas of body and mind come in which is a lot of which is a major focus of uh, what uh, works for upper caste uh, indian scholars right so because for me when i look into it uh, while there is there are ideas around it in our community a lot of it is also influenced by uh, how uh, other religions have shaped us like christianity or hinduism or even islam whatever a lot of people might have converted to so while the indian scholars are working on decolonization in respect like with, in regards to western uh, col colonialism but how do we the marginalized do it in respect to them i was curious about that and yeah. yeah, and the second question was uh, regarding uh, the diagnostic criteria. Like, uh, uh, I'm a student of uh, counseling and clinical uh, practice. Like, uh, and I wanted to know because, like, uh, when you were talking about diagnosis, so that also creates this particular idea about the person. Uh, there's a particular stigma yeah. attached to it. Yeah. Ki, oh, this person has bipolar disorder, or this person has schizophrenia. So, uh, in a manner, the person becomes doubly marginalized when they are coming from. Uh, the oppressed background so how do we navigate that sphere when we try to use psychology as a means to uh, bring a certain amount of justice to the oppressed communities i was curious about that and i hope i, I hope i was able to phrase those questions properly oh i think uh, you have phrased them really well ali and uh, as you mentioned justice is at the core and that she should be at the core and so in, to address one first question in terms of uh, developing uh, an indigenous psychology, see, the, the, the enterprise of developing an indigenous psychology is hijacked. It's hijacked by people who are privileged and they are defining the meaning of what exactly it means to be indigenous. See? What is important is to question those attempts and develop new definitions. Use the existing resource from the communities that we belong to and 
address these key questions uh, that relate to mind and the society, but not at the cost of one or the other. What is important and what I would emphasize is that there's certainly, I, always, I believe in multiplicity of psychologies, that we need multiple psychologies to address multiple human conditions that exist. So one set of psychology may not be enough. So what happens is that the kind of psychology we read is already committed to universalizing the phenomenon. It's already committing, uh, it talks about people as a whole. So you read any prominent theory, it is talking about people, but it is not saying honestly, it should say honestly, people only in the United States, because that is what they study. They study their concepts, validity of their concepts in the United States, in the Europe, and then they develop these generalizing to the whole population. That is quite problematic and it is being criticized now, which and there is a big emphasis now that how psychology is a weird discipline. Weird is an acronym that stands for Western, Industrial, Educated, etc. etc. Huh? And that is weird in the sense that it is actually deriving its justification from only a subset of people, but applying it to everyone. But what is needed, especially for the context we live in, is that we look at our communities, we look at our experiences, and we develop an ability to develop new tools and concepts from those experiences, which enriches psychology in the end. See, the project is, while criticizing psychology, the project is not about damaging and leaving it out and throwing it out. The project is about enriching it and project is about using it with some set of concern for justice as you have rightly said. So the, and again the same sort of point I could make about diagnostic criteria. Yes, we need to use the existing diagnostic criteria. We cannot just throw away DSM. We cannot just throw, throw it away and it has made mistakes. If, uh, once uh, I think just few decades back. DSM categorized homosexuality as a mental health issue, mental health disorder. Now it has removed that. Now it has apologized for that. Hmm? So certainly this has not happened automatically. It is because people resisted that categorization. They challenged that pathologization and that's how it changed. So in the same way, what must be done is that we need to engage in developing new psychologies, indigenous psychologies that address uh, the experiences of various communities in India. I hope uh, this answers your question. Yes, sir. That was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. So, Kesha, you can ask a question. Yeah. So, Professor, you mentioned the disciplinary aspect of psychology. In that way, my question relates to positivism and how positivism is seen as a problematic aspect in much of the social science discipline. So, I would like to uh, ask for your views of positivism vis-a-vis positivism -vis psychology and how this emphasis on scientific knowledge as the only authentic knowledge at time is also detrimental and kind of uh, is uh, instrumental in ignoring subjects like caste uh, in this discipline as you mentioned yeah no i think yeah at its heart psychology traditionally has been a positivist discipline it did believe and it did invest a lot in positivism but I don't think that it is the central characteristics of psychology right now. There is a great deal of emphasis on social constructionism. There is a great deal of emphasis on using uh, qualitative approaches to address various sets of problems. And so I do not think that the ex epistemic exclusion of caste happened because there was a commitment to positivism. It is hard to believe because 
Economics is also a positivist discipline, but it has been trying to address caste. If, if we look at the work done by Professor Thorad and colleagues, we see that this is, it is a positivistic work. Just engaging with the data and analyzing it, uh, developing those reports and, and, and work. So it's, it's still a positivistic enterprise, but it is, it is making an argument that is very justice oriented. It is developing an analysis of caste that is very powerful. It is developing a new economics of discrimination. Hmm? So while there are limitations to positivism, and there are, of course, many, many uh, insights we can develop by engaging into uh, social constructionism or various other sets of uh, philosophical orientation. I think what is important, as I mentioned in the previous question, uh, response to previous question, that the, the commitment to justice. If the commitment to justice is there, then we would definitely use the existing frameworks in the right direction. So I, I, start, I gave an example of a um, uh, doll studies conducted by Clark uh, and Clark. No, that was a, you, from one angle, that was a positivistic kind of a study, but it led to challenging racial segregation. It led to Brown versus Board of Education judgment that ended racial seg segregation in education and which played a significant part in civil rights movements in movement in US. So from that angle, I think the issue is more about how you use the tools that you get. Certainly no tool is perfect. The, the diagnostic criteria that uh, I was mentioning in the earlier in response to earlier question. Yes, they are not perfect, but having a critical approach towards them, using them in the right manner is something that is in our hands. And we can start with that and uh, refine our tools as we go further and further. And thank you, Professor. Pranesh, can you go next? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Hello? Am I audible? Yes, yes, Pranesh. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So, uh, like, I just wanted to understand, like, there are so many, uh, like, psychology based arts things like da dance therapy drama therapy art therapy and like within that there are specific forms like theater of the oppressed and there like there are specific like ideas in the dance therapy and nowadays we see a increasing trend over it in like in india especially in the metropolitan cities so how do you like do you think they have like these forms have like for someone who is slightly like practicing it i feel like there's a the, the conversation of cash hasn't yet begun in this forms and like what do you think like how how what will be a way to inculcate us that is one and the second is do you think psychology can take help from sociology or like other disciplines which have dis, dis, like which have understood caste in a much more deeper way to like make it india specific yeah a uh, very good question. So in terms of therapy, yes, there is uh, a good potential of therapy helping a distressed individual. But we must be very clear that not all therapies will be useful. So even when counselors prescribe or clinicians prescribe a therapy, they think carefully about what may work, what may be individually suited what may be contextually suited. And that is why multiple forms uh, of therapy exist and they must exist. But we must ask the question, therapy for whom? If there is a victimization by the social order, how can therapy to an individual resolve the complication? The therapy also need to include broader social change that has that is leading to mental justice if i experience past based humiliation on everyday basis i am receiving therapy because i feel socially anxious and traumatized uh, by those past based humiliating experiences my problem is not resolved 
while i need help to sustain and live as a decent dignified human being i also need to do something to address the condition that led to that moment of humiliation so the issue of caste based humiliation may not be resolved just by prescribing therapy to the individual so certainly we need empowering forms of therapy but empowering not just for the individual but also for the community and addressing the questions of justice and change in the community and second is there something that psychology can learn especially with regard to caste from sociology anthropology which have been a dominant disciplines in addressing caste certainly there is so much to learn there is so much to learn uh, but again i would emphasize having a critical focus interdisciplinarity definitely is needed we must develop because caste is such a complicated uh, social structure and oppressive structure that we need as many perspectives as possible that is why when we look at the scholarship of baba saheb we see that it is multifaceted it is not limited by the disciplines and that is a direction we must forge we address the problem whatever tools whatever disciplinary orientation come to our rescue i think we should be open to that we should be open to engagement but critical in our orientation so there is also a very interesting and insightful set of work in sociology anthropology and other social sciences but they also have their own problems and limitations and we must also be critical about that and then build our understanding on that basis i hope this answers your question yeah he has replied in the chat box thank you sir so thank next you. smriti can you go ahead um uh, thank you for that uh, insightful talk sir i am a psychology professor and as a professor i want to incorporate uh, these kind of discussions with uh, my lectures to my students so i want to know how i can start i often find that uh, um, the students that i teach in bank in the city of bangalore uh, most of them are unaware that caste is still a problem um, they do not um see the subtle discrimination that goes around them and they think that it's a problem of the past and i so i have to start a discussion with them about caste and i want to know what i what is your opinion on how i can engage them in this discussion and also um in academia i'm sure that in higher educational institution caste is still prevalent so can you also tell me some of the measures that i as a professor can take to you know Uh, to ensure that i do not engage in uh, practices that might be uh, in, uh, derogatory or that uh, i do not engage in caste practices in my right. profession yeah. right yeah no thank you so much for this question it is a very important question and i too grapple with this question a lot on an everyday basis and uh, so the question that how do you introduce caste uh to the students uh and introduce it in the right way so that they are able to address it uh or engage and understand it uh, go beyond their own biases question their assumptions it's it's a big challenge it's a big challenge because of the two sets of issues the first is issue of curriculum curriculum itself is not designed to especially in psychology to help you invoke these issues so maybe we make certain changes in the curriculum that bring some legitimate focus on these questions and that would be very useful second is the question of pedagogy now how do you invoke these issues how do we how do you uh, uh make students think about this 
So I teach BTEC students at IIT Delhi. Uh, what you will call as a 200 level course. It's always a big class. And BTEC students of all sorts. Uh, and of course, they they have means they, they take my course uh, to earn their humanity social science credit. They need to compulsory earn 15 credits. And uh, so while talking to them, one of my strategies is to is to start off with something that they understand. Because in the end, we don't simply want to talk about caste. We want to talk about diversity of human beings. We want to talk about societal arrangements. Maybe something that they find as an entry point. And I often find an entry point through talking about gender. Because it is the difference we are talking about. We are talking about human difference. And the gender-based human difference is easy to understand pedagogically. And then building on to that, then asking them to question their assumptions with regard to gender, gender roles, gender-based biases, etc. And then through that, opening up space for conversing on caste. I think what is important is to opening up that space and developing receptivity of our students to to engage with these conversations and question their assumptions. I would not directly challenge their, their assumptions because that would uh, then strengthen those biases. I have seen that. But uh, I would definitely encourage them to take more Socratic questioning kind of an approach and ask, just encourage them to ask more questions. Where is it? Why are you believing caste doesn't exist? Where does it come from? Why have you uh, not experienced it? So, or in what form you have experienced it. But the, the, the key point is, how do you explain the difference that exists in human beings? And through that, they build. And it can be built very easily. Difference in East and West, difference in, uh, in terms of uh, colonialism, the experience of colonialism, and then to gender, then to caste, I think. But, but they, it's definitely... Uh, uh, a teacher needs more work in order to create that safe space where and and uh, uh, more receptive space where these questions could be communicated and those biases could be addressed. But it is not enough. Your curriculum should also be leading towards that so that students feel that, okay, these are the important legitimate questions to ask. Otherwise, they will feel that it is imposed on them. One benefit of teaching in IIT is that I can set up my own curriculum. I can define what I want to teach in particular set of course. So that is that is the problem that I can get resolved. So I have more energy to work on my pedagogical approach and communicate that to students. And my approach always is, uh, if not cast directly, let's start talking about diversity, inclusion, equity. At least that is the common ground we can agree on and then taking the conversation forward. I hope this is helpful. Yes, sir. Thank you for that uh, wonderful answer. Uh, also, uh, the second part of my question was, how do I, as a professor, ensure that um, I do not uh, unconsciously engage in caste practices in my interaction with my students? Uh, how can we ensure an equitable space for all students from all backgrounds in academia? Yeah. Now, how do we do that? Uh, I think there is no no clear answer to that question. Uh, for me, the way I approach this, that how do I uh, not subscribe to the same sort of beliefs, some sort of questions, uh, some sort of assumptions while interacting with students. Uh, my approach is always sticking to the values that uh, and, and practicing these values because I think it's a it's quite a challenging uh, position we find ourselves in because students look up to us as role models and uh, of course we are human beings and it is very easy to slip into uh, deeply internalized biases that the society has created but we must take a personal uh, uh, responsibility of developing uh, uh, an anti-caste 
anti-racist, anti-sexist sort of an orientation that shows in our behavior as well. That shows in terms of our empathy towards people who are suffering, students who are uh, suffering, and then uh, building on to that. I think what is important is that sort of intellectual honesty that uh, Ambedkar had always emphasized that what is really important is to have that intellectual honesty and, and build on its basis. Uh, but even acknowledging that this is this can unconsciously happen, automatically happen, I think is still a very big step. Even being conscious of that is a big step. And uh, I would really emphasize that, that, uh, that having that sort of awareness is in itself uh, uh, is, is a step towards resolution. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So I think we are running out of time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Professor. Uh, so we, I think we can end up here. The messages and the reflections which has been shared in the chat box will be conveyed to the professor. And I would like to thank, thank every participant. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. So, so thank you, everyone, for joining this event today. So I have shared the uh, Instagram page of our Ambedkar Reading Circle in the chat box. Everyone can join and follow for to know more about the upcoming events. Thank you all for joining. And thank you, Professor, for joining us. It was really an engaging talk, and we have got a lot of insights, and especially for the practitioners who have joined for this event. Thank you all. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure, and all the best to ARC. I hope you do many more such events, and they become much more successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor. Thank you. Good job, Vignesh. Thank you. Yeah.